Hey, it's Mazzy, and this is a very special episode. Coffee Dave, serial killer. We're going to talk records. Coffee Dave, serial killer. He hasn't been around. <laughs> he hasn't been around in a while. Who's that guy? Go kill Go kill that person. Hey. What the? Hey, that person fact, just walked, be, you know walked in the middle of our set. Not welcome here. They're not welcome here. You know why? Because they, we're in a parking lot right now, and I don't know where that guy came from. Okay, we're gonna hang around, uh, hang around the uh, record library to talk records, music. It's, it's loud here. We're in Georgetown, neighborhood of Seattle, Washington, near Boeing Field. I want like one of those those planes to fly. Like, they come yeah, really low. We here. need we need the low flying commercial jet, maybe UPS, something of commerce. And what we need also is less noise right now, which we're getting, but we can't conduct it right here. We need more time. We need a special place. Wait a minute. Wait, are you? Oh, hold on. Let me, wait a minute. So Coffee Dave kills it. We're going to just chat about records because that's what two guys do, chat about records. That's why you come here. Uh, some of you who are new don't know who Coffee Dave is, but he's been on a pl plethora. You know what the word plethora means? Many of multiple of times. of the videos here on uh, <clears throat> the channel, and uh, we're here on this Friday afternoon. I have a Guinness, and he's got a che cheap ass Rainier. Local fair, not so really show the anymore. label. So because there's people all over the world that don't know. You know, based based on Mount Rainier, right? But brewed in California. Is it really? Yes. It's true. And this it's is okay. Brewed in Ireland. Now, uh, I have spent some time in Dublin and Glendalock in the region. Went there for a wedding years ago. And the Guinness is so much better in Ireland. It doesn't even, you know, this is like wrong. This is out of the re refrigerator, right? You know, it needs to be room temperature if you really want to enjoy it. Yeah, they really should be sending it, you know, out of St. James Gate over across the sea. Just keep it in there. But uh, hey. Yeah, it's, in cans, it's it, fine. It's a manly brew. Ah, yes, it is. And I like it too. <laughs> so uh, good. So, but but seriously, it's better if you haven't been to Ireland. You have to. It's like food, drinking Guinness. Those of you who are from Ireland, if you're watching, it's also full of antioxidants. Oh, there. So it's, we're going to be healthier after we make it, we yeah. record this video. Oh, we're just going to. We're just. This is very loose. This is not a whack a mole. <laughs> this is not a. Uh, uh, it's the music, stupid. This is not. Uh, autobiographical, so this is not uh, Memories of a Vinyl Junkie. This is just hanging her out with a, a local uh, Pacific Northwesterner, a S Seattle life. You were born on the east side? Born and raised, actually, at the University of Washington, 69. So, so, yeah. so he was born here. Uh, yeah, yeah. But yeah. I want to show, I do want to show a record I picked up. I used to have mm -hmm. this record, and, and for some reason, during my purge, I didn't have it. I just found it here in Seattle, used. This is Can You Hear Me? Okay, this is great, and this brings back a lot of memories. This is this is music from the Deaf Club, and I want to talk to. I've mentioned the Deaf Club before. Uh, Jashid Brooks, who's my friend in San Francisco, and I used to go to the Deaf Club on Valencia Street, and literally, as you can see here, Club of the Deaf. It was an actual club for deaf people on Valencia Street upstairs. Wooden floors, not a huge space. There's a jukebox on one end. You walk in the stage to the left. And I saw like Chrome Dinette, no, Chrome Set, what's the name of the band? I saw The Mutants, I saw Dead Kennedys. But this is a live record, independent live record. And it has the Dead Kennedys, it has a KG-13, has the Offs, has the Mutants, Tuxedo Moon, uh, Pink Section, and this is uh, optional Walking Dead records, and and I, out of Berkeley. But this is a cool live comp from the Deaf Club, and I just was so excited to see this perfect. Is it rare? I mean, I don't know if it's expensive. It, it cost me twenty five bucks, but I don't care. I had to have it. it. Has the insert in it, the Deaf Club. I wonder. if... I am not in the picture, but look at that. I mean, this is. Look how great that is. Look look at and a lost eat punk era. So I think that for the rest of the video, we're just gonna chat about the Death Club. <laughs> I 
Okay. <laughs> now, someone's going to think I'm mocking deaf people. I am not mocking no, deaf people. No, we're not. We're not but, doing um, that. But look at this. Look at this. Oh, oh this is clean. Looks like no one ever played it, it looks right? looks nice and... Look that's a that. fresh one right there. Look at that. Totally present. fresh. Look at that. Look fresh. at that. Um, so I don't want to say There's like two songs from the Mutant, three tracks from Dead Kennedys, KGB two sets. Uh, the Offs <clears throat> three tracks. Tuxedo Moon one. Oh, they do uh, 19th Nervous Breakdown, is the Stone song. Tuxedo Moon. <laughs> Tuxi okay, I used to see Tuxedo Moon, Snake Finger, and The Residents. They're uh, the three bands on Ralph Records. Uh, they're the, that local, Snake I want to say commune, not really communal, but um, uh, art rock, uh, conceptual rock, performance art. Uh, and we used to see them all the time uh, in San Francisco. Which I will add to that too, although I'm not a uh, you know native of San Francisco, I've always had a thing for uh, the residents. And of course, we all know some of the filthier, I don't know if we say it's filthy, but it's maybe to some people it would be offensive. But I have to say that, uh, of course, there are albums like Eskimo and other ones that are great, Meet the Res Meet the. Uh, Meet the Resonance, uh, but also, uh, of course, Third Reich and Roll, which, you know, I know it was very like, uh, but in 77, even when I listen to it today, I'm really astounded. Uh, they were very, very much ahead of their time, I would think, and um, very, very, very Bay Area, Do you specifically know? San Francisco, of course. Yeah, the I mean, arts, and underground they, art scene was they pretty came remarkable, with, you know? Uh, they came from the east or Florida or south, I forgot where, uh, and they they first were down on the peninsula south of San Francisco, I think. Maybe in South San Francisco, even a Redwood City somewhere, and they had a, a warehouse and a performance space, and they were one of the early groups that were mixing, um, you know, eight millimeter films and stop action and. And again, I've said this before, and I'm going to give a little shout out again to Tom Rashawn, who is in Los Angeles. He was in uh, LAMFS, the Los Angeles Free Music Society. And I always see them as a parallel. Now, eventually, if, if, if um, Tom and I ever have a, a conversation, I'm going to ask him if, he, if they were aware of each other. Because I didn't know about the Los Angeles Free Music Society during uh, the 80s when I was in the late 70s, too. When, well... Actually, the early 70s, when I was 74, when the first Residence album came out. And I didn't know about LAFMS. And uh, I, and I, as I said before, I got to know Tom because of it, his art direction of records for uh, Warner Brothers and then uh, Columbia Records. So do you know Coffee Dave? We'll call you, can I call you Cough? Yes, you can. Coffee. Yeah, just, just abbreviate it. Um, it's easier that way. Mouthful, you know. What? To me. Do you know of any, what, was there a, 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 an equivalent type of music scene in Seattle? Were there performance, and maybe there were and you just don't know about it, but, you know, performance, avant-garde, conceptual, noise rock, uh, a multimedia artist bands here? Well, I will say that even though I, as a young lad back in the early 80s, um, when I was in my uh, early teens, a uh, very young teenager, okay, I'll just throw it out there. And in 1982, 1983, just when I was starting to get interested in music as a kid uh, on the east side of Seattle in Bellevue, the ritzy suburb that people might be aware of that's right adjacent to Redmond where Microsoft is. Uh, and, Kirkland, was, and Kirkland. And Kirkland. And sure. Kirkland. Kirkland is yeah. Costco. That's why you see Kirkland garbage bags. Kirkland Signature, right? Signature. That's, that's, that's Costco. Costco. Yeah, yeah. They're, and their headquarters are there. I think they're in Issaquah, which is another suburb adjacent to those suburbs there um, all the but, native american names up here, here yes you know seattle you know duwamish all the yeah the yeah we have to go with the uh with the with the, with the northwest and the yeah the native american uh leftover names that were co-opted but i don't think bellevue was i think bellevue's beautiful view and kirkland peter kirk puget Sound. Yeah, you know there was so that i don't know this stuff yeah but in bellevue in the east side on the music scene it was uh I was a naive young man, and uh, just recently, actually, be becoming aware of it, um, the scene there, there was something called the Lake Hills Roller Rink in the crossroads. Uh, it's uh, the eastern part, uh, kind of the backwater of Bellevue. They had a skating rink there. They'd have metal shows and things like that there, but they'd also have a few sort of alternative, uh, you know, punky bands. And uh, the one that I know that I never saw, but then I realized... Um, 
has sort of a, uh, it's this uh, uh, sort of a historically relevant, Mr. Epp and the Calculations, a band that Mark Arm from H Mud Honey was in uh, back in the day. And there was a couple other players too. I, I think if I could consult some of my friends who are um, probably more knowledgeable about this, they would say it. But I went on w Wikipedia and looked and there's a record store that I also used to hang out at when I was a young lad that they tolerated me as a very um probably annoying kid but it's where i went after school it's called roboto records in bellevue and um mr epp and the calculations were i think even somebody who worked there was either a drummer in the band or knew the band again i'm don't quote me directly but you would see them spray painted on you know somebody would do some very like cheap tag graffiti, Mr. Epp and the Calculations. And as a kid, I was, who's Mr. Epp and the Calculations? I just didn't know. But later on, it turned out that it did have some uh, some uh, foundations. And what we all know is now is, you know, maybe the beginning of the grunge era. And Can you tell me about River. these records? Can you tell me about these records? That's the, what, the super, that's not super fuzz. Big, big Don't ask me, you're the Pacific Northwesterner. I'm, I'm a novice. I'm a Frisco kid. This is one of their first, yeah, this is their first, I think, sort of big, um, you know, sort of breakthrough kind of early, um, you know, wasn't obviously something that everybody um, beyond that was aware of, but it certainly is, um, became iconic in its own right. Uh, so of course, Sub Pop. Um, and is that like Charles Peterson? You see the photographer who took that um, picture, the guy who did, uh, you know, took pictures in Nirvana and all that. A lot of, you know, cool black and white rock shots. Well, we know Lance Mercer, too. Uh, he's a friend of our a friend, Coffee Julie. Your competition, Coffee. <laughs> Can you believe <laughs> and that? And most people would rather have coffee, coffee Julie here rather than Coffee Dave. Yeah. No offense, Coffee Dave. No, no, no. Uh, no offense, Dave. But um, I am. But Lance Mercer did a lot of the Pearl Jam's uh, bands and, and uh, you know, all the, the, nor the rawr, rawr, those kind of bands that sang like, rawr, like that back in their 90s. You know, they moaned a lot? <laughs> kind of, Jeremy, Jeremy. That guy, <laughs> right. you know. And then from San this? Diego, anyway. This? That is a great album. Um, Every Good Boy Deserves Fudge, a fine album that came out in 91. Um, Honestly, one of my favorites personally. Everybody's got their own. I know the early stuff, like, you know, the Super Fuzz, that was their thing. I'm not, people are going to say this, like, what a dork. But honestly, no, a really great, great, awesome album. Um, I think it's very underappreciated for what it is, if that's your thing. But it's a great album. I think it's one of their best, personally. 91, um, a must own, in my opinion. Um, and just to, yeah. I won't bore you with the details. Just check it out if you ever have the chance. Um, and I just think they reissued it too. Um, so, and on CD too. If you want to get on CD, it's, that's fine too. We're not, we're not going to be snobs. Um, it looks like mazzy has got a pretty nice copy of it. Well, those are the reissues. I have the reissues. Oh, they're perfect. No, yeah. they're great. They're, so they're, since, they're awesome reissues. Since we're, talking, really well since we're talking about this... <clears throat> Um, you know, it's, this isn't like Seattle versus San Francisco. <laughs> Maybe that's what the, sh the concept should have been, but we didn't think of that until just now. But let me go back to San Francisco oh, and, go, and go back to Alternative Tentacles yes. and, of course, this great cover. And this, and it's funny, uh, great uh, East Bay Ray, there's, there's a, I think on YouTube, East Bay Ray was an original mm -hmm. member of the Dead Kennedys. And there's an interview around because this has just been remixed and reissued. I don't know if it needs a remix. You start thinking, the punk punk records, you need a remix? That's what's, a, yeah, I don't know. I kind of want to hear it. I almost want to buy it. It comes out today, I believe. And it's a remix of this album because they said the original, but you know, come on. Squeeze out that extra fidelity from right. those really, really refined, super high budget studio releases back then, right? Like, you know, big label. Oh wait, no. Well, this is all ten of ten. Is. No, uh, he no, was in Noe Valley. I mean, I you know I grew up. I saw the Dead <laughs> Kennedys ten, twelve, fifteen times at all kinds of places. Almost house parties, punk clubs, the Def Club, Mabuhe Gardens, um, the back. I don't know if they played the back door, but yeah, they were playing all over. And of course, Jill Biafra ran for mayor and of San Francisco, of course. Uh, but wasn't just, controversial you know, or anything. I, no, I went to a lot of these. I went to a ton of punk shows, but in that day, I didn't buy as many punk records because for me, I always thought that uh, 
punk music for me at that time was better alive than playing it at home. There's a few exceptions. The stuff I was playing home in terms of punk was more of the artsy, poetic punk, like, uh, and people, there are people out there who, some of you hardcore punk or punksters will say Patti Smith is not punk or Talking Heads. That's the stuff I was into, the more artsy side of things. Maybe Richard Hell and the Voidoids. Um, you know, this, those, early, those first records on Psy Records, Blondie. New was, wave crossover. Yeah, the new wave stuff that has a little more melody if you want to call it and that. not hardcore. The Ramones, I liked uh, that type of stuff. Uh, but in San Francisco, the Mutants and Crime, I saw Crime. Uh, they opened they opened for the Sex Pistols show into Winterland. So um, anyway, I just thought we'd kind of talk, since we're talking about the Seattle scene. Any, so, any, any DRI or Circle Jerks? Circle Jerks. I don't think DRI. Circle Jerks, yes, definitely. Um, I mean, we could always use the Repo Man soundtrack as a, as a popular indexing, but I don't even want to bring that up because I know there's going to be some people who are aware they're going to cringe when I say that. But truth be told... Again, as the naive suburban kid that I was, I think Repo Man was one of the first times I got introduced to some of those bands. You it's a great know. soundtrack. And it is a great soundtrack. It really is. Great I, film, too. Yeah, great film. Fantastic film. Yeah. And, you know, Alex Cox, it's a it's a masterpiece, in my opinion. But, yeah, I don't know. So, Emilio Estevez yeah. and um, the, the character. Dean Stanton. Dean Stanton. I mean, some of his finest moments, I well, think. Well, I like, I'm a big fan. <laughs> we talk about, let's merge into <laughs> film <laughs> cinema a little bit. <laughs> Some people think it's like watching paint dry, but I'm a big fan of Vim Vendors, and I love Paris, Texas. It's, it's like a road picture, um, you know, with, is it Natasha Kinski in yes. that? Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, and that's a good sound, Ry Cooter soundtrack there. Uh, I don't need to get it right now. Kind but, of a period piece in its own way yeah. for what, what, what it showed back then, and again, with Vendors kind of style, the sl slow-moving... You know, you might not be able to... It might put some people to sleep, but it certainly did sort of divulge, I think... That, year, that period of time, it gave it that flavor, kind of like not to di go divert, but... We divert no anyway. No country, yeah, we always do. No yeah. country for old men, you know, that... Similar with, pacing. They get the, they get this, it's slow, they get the period right, 1980, as I always like to say, they, they really nailed 1980, the Coen brothers in that film. Um, and yes, again, when the film, when Paris, Texas came out from that year, from what, 82? 83, something, something like, that. like that. So, I mean, a period that's kind of odd in um, cin cinema, popular culture, c at least for me, because at that point I was like a, you know, 12, 13 year old kid. So, uh, and was learning a lot later on after the fact when I, you know, was older. Um, so anyway, yeah. Vendors. Wow. Wasn't well, Bo and Bowie too, right? I mean, was it well, Man I, Who Fell to Earth? That's that's Vendors too, right? But no, that's it's a, not. No, that's that, not. No, that's um. No, oh. that, that's um. Oh, that's not Vendors. Okay. That's that's um. I'm, I will think of it in a minute, but um. Aha! Of course, great soundtrack. Every Ry Cooter soundtrack is fabulous. Um, Big Ry Cooter fan. Jim Dickinson, who played and co-wrote with a lot of stuff mm -hmm. with Ry Cooters on here. David Lindley are the musicians. There's three musicians, and um, it's it's fabulous. It, you know, you can pick up the Ry Cooter soundtracks pretty pretty cheap. You have the uh, that you know the uh, promo. the old school promo. This is a promo yeah. copy I got. Gold I, have, I got so many promos from Warner Brothers at this point. Originally mastered by Bernie Grunman. Okay, one of the mastering masters. Yeah, um, the, mm -hmm. you know, he used to be. I think when he did the classic records, he got a little bright. A little bright mastering, but it, but this is not about mastering. This is about the music, stupid. We're not going to talk about Bob Ludwig. We're not going to talk about Clear Mountain. You know, this is about records and just enjoyment. Now, um, we're going to go... The way our minds work is we we just go in different... All tangents. over the place. Tangents. We're tangen the tangential. But let's let's kind of keep it back and forth a little bit with yeah. uh, the Pacific Northwest and San Francisco. So I showed those Dead Kennedys things. Oh, go quickly going back again to Vim Vendors. One of my all-time favorite films is Vim Vendors' Wings of Desire with Bruno Ganz. If you know who Br Bruno Ganz is, Bruno Ganz, Ganz, German actor, you know him from all those memes that were around for like two years of Adolf Hitler in the bunker, where all those uh, YouTube videos, remember they changed like YouTube, uh, <laughs> Hitler freaks out because they found 
secret documents at Mar-a-Lago or, or the Giants win the fuck up the World Series or whatever it is. Isn't that where they would interject like bits from Downfall and then sort of yes. try to like take it and, and mash it up and, and make it Bruno, all kind of a comedy? Anyway, the actor is Bruno Ganz, a German actor, plays Hitler in that movie. And he's the star. He's been in a few Vim Vendors films, but um, I first got to know him because one of my favorite Vim Vendors films is American Friend with Dennis Hopper. And that's the second time... Uh, in cinema that they did a version of a Patricia Highsmith a Ripley book. You might have heard of the talented Mr. Ripley. Well, the first uh, Ripley... Uh, in fact, uh, Patricia Highsmith, who wrote that book, is a mystery writer, great mystery writer. Her first claim to fame that I got into, which is one of my favorite Alfred Hitchcock films, is Strangers on a Train, uh, where they cross, you know, they trade off... Uh, murders, like I do your murder, you do my murder, so no one can connect me to your murder. And of course, there was the uh, remake parody, not remake, but based on that uh, with Danny DeVito and I forgot who was in it. Throw Mama from a Train. No, Throw Mama from a Train. Yeah, that's the one. 88. Yeah, that's so one. so that's that's sort of a remake. See, we're going in all these different directions, but Vim Vendors made American Friend the first... Uh, Tom Ripley in 1958 or 59, a film called Blue, uh, Purple, Purple Noon, Purple Noon, uh, a French film based on uh, the Ripley's game or Talented Mr. Ripley. And of course, we uh, the Talented Mr. Ripley, the movie that Matt Damon was in and Jude Law. And uh, what a, that, a great, great film. All those stories, uh, Ripley's Game, The Boy of Follow Ripley. I'm a big fan of Patricia Highsmith's books. And see, we get it. We need to get into literature once in a while. There's not enough literature Seems in the like vinyl lot, community. Well, it's a lost thing because well, I read a book. To, yeah, so hard to do in this day and age, and you know, short attention spans, and the internet. Who has time to read a book? Uh, but plenty of people. But so right. okay, I did Dead Kennedys. Now talk about some more Pacific Northwest music that you either. I grew up with whatever, just anything music. Well, back in the Bumbershoot days of my youth, I remember um, one of the bands that was very prominent that would open for a lot of other bands. Um, one of them was called Mondo Vita. Now that's another. Uh, I think the Young Fresh Fellows was another one. These are two like I've very heard of Fresh Fellows, but never Mondo Vita. Yeah, and I never was. I didn't listen to the Fresh Fellows as much, but for some reason, I had a as a it was. Um, what was the name of the album? It was um, uh, Fins de Paris. Uh, Fins de Paris was the name of the album. It had a 50s reference on the front of it. It was all sort of like very 80s, 50s kind of a thing. Like and the they French would... New Wave? No. No, just the name of the album. Like, you know, they were Not trying Jean to... Not Jean-Luc Godard-like. Yeah, they were trying to be hipster, I think, before hipster it's, was... It's the French cinema. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's, it's not so much, uh, you know, it's like... A... Yeah. Yeah. Not like that. No, not like Miles Davis and the, uh, yeah, which is, that's a, that's one to definitely pick up. Okay, great. Yeah. I don't know. It was fun. It was, I, I, it reminded me, okay, so here's, they opened up and another band that I had no clue of that wasn't from Seattle, Spinal Tap. They were playing <laughs> at, Spinal so they were playing, yeah, they were playing at Bumbershoot in the fall of 1984. Um, or in September, it was about this time of year when they, you know, would have Bumbershoot every year. Anyway. I took the bus over from the east side by myself. Um, I did have friends, but no friends came with me on that date. And so I went by myself. I said, I'm just going to go check Dave this out. alone at Bumbershoot. Alone as a four, 13, 14 year old kid. I just throw the dates out because I was just give it a year or more. I'm not, you know. but yeah, I, I was, I was, I was a young lad going to the show. Didn't know what I was in for. I think Mondo Vita did open up for Spinal Tap, which is what I was there for. And I thought the Spinal Tap band, like, who the hell are they? And the movie had just come out, too. And so I didn't know that it was a... I mean, this is how naive I was. I didn't know it was a parody. I mean, I knew it was a not a necessarily a real band. But when I saw them open up, they were like a real... You know, you had Harry Shearer and Christopher McKean and, you know... Uh, I mean, all those guys were on stage playing, and it was a really, really awesome show. I mean, they had the theatrics and everything, the skulls coming down with the dry ice coming on. I think they finished the set with Give Me Some Money, and at the end, people were throwing change out of their pockets. And when the, and when the show was over, the guy sweeping the stage had a mound of change on the stage, a, a mini mountain of change that all the people had thrown up there on top. So, although the Mondo Vita show may have been, I don't know, who knows, it was, 
you know, again, a, a, a early iconic band, the Spinal Tap show is incredible. And much different from, dare I say, some people might cringe again, seeing Stevie Ray Vaughan, I think, in the same bumper shoot week uh, for Couldn't Stand the Weather tour um, up front. That has nothing to do with the Northwest. But again, what's this band? Who are they? The beginnings of my uh, music, uh, my times listening to music and seeing Van Halen 1984 at the Coliseum in March of 84, which was my first studio or I'm sorry, my first uh, stadium show. Um, and my parents dropped me off and picked me up from. They were so kind. I don't did know. You go how, like, did you go to Lona that too? No, I went with a couple of friends. Uh, so that, that was good. So I wasn't I wasn't solo for that. And then... So uh, Jump. That's Jump. Yeah, Jump and all that. Yeah, Panama. Again, say what you will, but that was my whole thing. And then before, the last thing I want to say is the first show that I actually saw in the Northwest. And this was... Some Northwest bands, and also, so, so it was Culprit, Q5, and Lita Ford. And Lita Ford was the opening act. And I actually won the tickets because I called the radio station. There was a raffle, and I actually ended up winning two tickets for the show as a kid. I don't know how that happened. And I brought my best friend, Matt, who I'm still one of my best friends today, still lives in the area. We went to go see that show. So that was my first show at the Moore Theater in Seattle in, in uh, 1984. So 1984 is a big year for me. What does that have to do with local Seattle music? But, I that, don't know, but, but that's but, what was but, going no, on but here. We're you know, talking kid, about our you know? scene growing up. Yeah. So. Um, I'm going to stick with this whole like post-punk, new wave, art rock stuff because um, I've talked uh, immensely about going to Winterland and the bands I saw late 60s and the 70s and all the kind of classic rock bands and only a few times have I talked, I, you know, I talk about the Sex Pistols show, but uh, again, jazz shit Brooks and I, aside from going to the Keystone Corner and seeing all these great jazz acts, like anyone who was still playing, we'd go see pretty much uh, jazz wise. But Brooks was my only friend that we'd go together to see new wave punk performance art, avant-garde shit, uh, weird ass shit and, we, and, and a thing called Club Anonymous. South of Market, way out uh, industrial areas of San Francisco where they had these clubs that would change out locations all the time because they were illegal clubs and they'd have fashion shoots and art performances. There, there was the Art Motel, which is right above the club now. That's the stud uh, that used to be on Folsom Street. Now it's on Harrison Street. I don't know if it still is San Francisco, but my all my friends who grew up with me in music in the late 60s and 70s, just weren't into the whole punk and new uh, the punk scene. And Brooks was the only one, he was the only one of my friends that was really adventurous like me. Uh, this isn't so adventurous, but I just thought about this because this is a Mutants album from 1982. They were kind of a quirky, fun band. They weren't punk. They were artsy, but a little, I want to say circus-like. Uh, not as serious as a talking. It's almost not serious at all. But this is a cool thing. This is the, and this is what I love about this is this is the fun terminal that was on um, off of Mission Street, and it was literally when it was all night, but literally across from the from the bus station that has been now been tore down and Salesforce Tower. And it's you would like anyone coming from the doesn't 19, look quite the same. No, from 1982, <laughs> you wouldn't. They tore down everything. It's all tech central now there in San Francisco. But this was this old funky sketchy you know, cum filled. Um, I don't know about that. But, uh, you know, just video games and arcades and uh, sketchy people. But uh, I, I kind of like this place because I remember this place. We used to kind of go by there and we used to see there was a couple of open parking lot, lots and there was this performance art by um, SLR, which is a SRL, SRL, Survival Research Labs. A guy named Mark Pauline, Google him, he's still around, he's doing these performance art. Mark Pauline and Survival uh, Research would do these robotic, like things like robotics that would have flamethrowers and they put like like uh, uncooked chickens from Chinatown on them, not living, <laughs> and they would flame them and they would be this explosions and things blowing up and they'd have, after the punk shows or before punk shows, this one parking lot that was open, there was a bus parking lot during the week for the commuter buses, and on the weekends it was empty, so they'd have these events and survival research. Mark Pauline would, 
and his team would do these amazing robotic, like three or four things at once. And he still does them. So Google Mark Pauline survival lab or research, survival research. And they're just bizarre shit, like throwing flames at each other and like, like, uh, very, what do you call them? Uh, catapults of those spiking things. I mean, very medieval ass. Uh, performance shit, mechanical performance shit. And up here in Seattle, I mean, even again, I, a, a, pre, a little bit before my time, but they would have been playing most likely for all the people watching that are in the know that know more than me, um, Gorilla Gardens, a place like that, that was, it, it was, you know, iconic, but all surfers, um, all the punk bands that would come into town that again, I regrettably miss now or wish I had gone, but I was just a little bit too young at that point. But even friends of mine who were of my age, let's just say maybe they were a bit more switched on than me at that time and the music that they were into, a little bit ahead of the game. But yeah, there was a number of clubs that were kind of freewheeling back then that people, you know, and they would just show up. There's actually a banner you can, with a butthole surfers that has, you can, you can look it up, you know, they sent archived on, you know, online, you can go see it. But it's kind of cool. I mean, uh, people saw a lot of really cool shows there and they saw a lot of, um, I mean, and even on a new wave, um, you know, sort of a goth kind of level, you had um, places like the Monastery and Scoochies, um, which were much different than those clubs. And then later on in the beginning of the, uh, you know, in the, in the heart of the Seattle, um, you know, but some people would say grunge, I guess, if they want to call it that. But look at the super rock bands of Seattle, up and coming, as I call them, uh, rock candy, places like that, that we also, um, great shows at those places. That's as the well. place right, right on the side of I-5, right? Yes. It's it, called it, something else now. The off-ramp, which is now El Corazon. El Corazon. The, and those places were close to each other. Anybody who watches this, it's probably they're, they're probably yawning, but... Great, great venues with a lot of great shows. That's a great album. I mean, The Locust Abortion Technicians, a fine album. And Touch and Go is a great Chicago label, as everybody knows. And a, what, a, what a band, you know, a band that I don't think probably got the credibility that it deserved. I don't know if they wanted credibility, but it certainly doesn't have the kind of, again, after the fact, it was kind of like, wow, this is really amazing bands um, that, uh, you know, still hold up today. That album holds up today. Yeah, it's great. It's great. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of uh, it's a different period. He was obviously, I, I always like to say I'm kind of envious because of where in the time frame, I feel like I kind of missed some of the stuff. But then looking back, kids sometimes now say, I always like to say the kids, but you mentioned stuff and they're like, wow, you got to see that. And I'm like, ah, you know, yeah, but I, I'm it was great. Eight years old and you're 50. Four, 53. 53. Yeah. So, so there you go. We're you old, go. We're, you know, but we're both old. Now. I got 15, 16 years on you. I know. But, and I'll be there. I can, I almost want to do the, the emoji face with the, with the, I can't do it. Nix that. So we should have these. If it, uh, You got to put in the comments if you want us to have more of these conversations like this. This is just like free form, improvisational. And we're not shit ace drunk. This is my shit ass ace drunk. I can't even talk. I'm a little shit buzzed, but I'm not drunk. This though. is my first beer. I had an orange soda for lunch. So this is my actually my fourth Rainier, but it's only about this full. And it's a Rainier. It's four point four percent. Yeah, but talk about Pacing the ice. music scene. Things we grew up with. Personal stories of uh, Seattle area and San Francisco area and anything else. Anyway, I think that kind of. Yeah, we could keep it brief. We got a little over a half an hour, right? 32 minutes plus that wonderful, wonderful on location introduction. Oh. You already saw that, right? Did you see it? Well, they saw it. Oh, God. I don't know. You saw it before. It so this is uh, the um, Coffee Dave serial killer issue. <laughs> no. Special We don't know what it's... I don't know. I need Special to I need to give this, uh, this video a real, like, kick-ass... Um, I need to give it a, a name that it's going to suck you in. What do you call it? A what's the what am I thinking of? A uh, a grab bag thumbnail and a um a gotcha. click, clickbait a clickbait. clickbait title. So we got to do a clickbait title. So we're not talking analog anymore. This is the digital age. So lean in, Dave. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Mazzy loves yeah. you.